Jennifer Koblinski is an assistant professor of pathology um, at the Feinberg School of Medicine, and she works in the area of breast cancer metastasis, making extensive use of animal models. She's one of our resident experts on animal models, actually, and helps a lot of the investigators down there use animal models. And she's also going to talk to us a little bit about uh, cell lines, which we've been talking about, but we haven't described in detail. Okay, so as Bennett mentioned, um, I was asked to talk to you guys today about cancer cells, tissue culture, and animal models. And so what I want to do, and to keep the, I'm just going to give you a broad background on both of these, so feel free to ask me any specific questions. And I'm going to try to give you examples of some of my research and how they fit in using um, tissue culture and um, animal models. And so to start with, I just had these pictures up. This is breast cancer cells growing in plastic on a tissue culture dish. And they're labeled with M. cherry fluorescent protein, so they're stable expressing this protein. And we also have cells that are labeled with green fluorescent protein, and we injected these breast cancer cells into the mice. We can find tumors growing um, in the brain of these mice using a fluorescent dissecting scope. And I'll show you a little bit more about that later. <clears throat> but I just wanted to point out at the beginning that there's so many different tools out there to use to look at your cancer cells, too. And these are just two of the um, examples of fluorescent proteins you can use to see your cells. So I want to give you a background um, just about thinking about that you're, when you're doing these studies and looking at cancer cells and tissue culture, you need to think about the broader picture, too. And I know Dr. Munchie will talk to you tomorrow about the tumor microenvironment and metastasis. But I'm going to give you a really brief overview here. Um, so here we have a normal breast duct, and it's made up of epithelial cells, myoepithelial cells, and then the basal lamina, or basement membrane, which is made up of proteins such as laminin, fibronectin, um, collagen, spore, um, and proteoglycans. And then surrounding it is more extracellular matrix, which is usually something like collagen 1. And then fibroblasts reside here. Um, fat cells in the breast, and immune cells. And all of these things are interacting and causing, forming the architecture of the duct and of the breast, and also are very important in what the cells are doing. And then in order um, for the cells to invade and metastasize, I'm sure you've learned this morning more about abnormal proliferation occurs, and then the cells break through this basement membrane. So here they're interacting with the basement membrane. And then they start to interact with the stroma and the stromal cells even more. And there could be direct contact. In order to metastasize, they must move into the, or it's thought that they move into the vasculature or into the um, lymphatics. And here they're going to interact with lymph cells or possibly endothelial cells, um, platelets here. And then once they move out of the circulation into um, other organs, in order for it to be a metastasis, they must proliferate at the site and grow. And um, an important step in all of this also um, is angiogenesis, the growth of new blood vessels. So all of this involves a variety of interactions of the tumor cells with all of this environment. And um, I just want to point out, too, that I have cells here labeled green. As I was saying, we use a green fluorescent protein. And there's different steps, as I'll tell you about, like in using animal models. And here, the cells are labeled green. We inject them into the circulation. And then you can detect them in the different organs, as I showed you. So, and there's different steps of this process that the different animal models um, we'll be talking about will look at. So what's tissue culture? It's a tool for the study of animal cell biology using convenient in vitro model of cell growth. We're trying to mimic in vivo cell behavior in vitro. And so some examples are looking at mechanism of cell cycle control, detection and function of growth factors and hormones, and the study of specialized cell functions and cell-cell and cell matrix interactions. And I'll talk about this a little bit more in detail. Um, this environment is usually highly selective in a defined environment, which is easy to manipulate, so that we can look at just certain aspects and one example is um, cell signaling pathways, when we're interested in what's going on inside the cell to cause, for example, the change in this nodal protein that Bennett talked about. 
So we can use a very defined environment to look at what causes the changes. So there's a couple different types um, of tissue culture or cell types you'll hear about as primary cultures versus a cell line. A primary culture is usually a freshly, is freshly isolated from tissue source. And for example, the tissue is freshly removed from the human patient or a mouse. And um, these cells usually have a finite um, amount of life so that you can only subculture them, perhaps three to 10 to 15 cultures, and then the cell line will die out. A cell line is usually established from a primary culture, and this is a continuous cell line that's transformed or, or mortal. And some tumor cell lines can transform on their own. Sometimes we use viruses to transform them to keep them growing. And so there are cell lines that have been probably passed out there over 500 times or more. So there's also monolayer versus suspension types of cultures. Monolayer cells migrate and proliferate by attachment, and so they're considered anchorage-dependent growth. And these are commonly exhibited by most normal cell types. Many tumor cells exhibit anchorage dependence, but they can grow usually in suspension. And so a suspension cell can proliferate without attachment, and that's considered anchorage independent growth. And these are usually restricted to hemopoietic cells and transform cells or tumors. So most leukemia cells, you'll see they can, they'll grow in suspension. Um, many tumor cells from epithelial origin will grow um, attached, but if you take them off the um, tissue culture plate and put down something like auger where they don't have to attach to it, they'll usually survive where a normal cell won't. So that's a hallmark of um, tumor, uh, a tumor phenotype. So uh, things to consider when doing tissue culture. You want to think about the culture surface. Usually the tissue culture dishes are coated with a positive charge. So if you try to throw your cells into um, just a petri dish that might be used for bacteria, you might find that they're not growing because they weren't able to attach. Um, do you also want to consider um, matrix coating, and as I talked, and we'll talk about a little bit more, interaction with the basement membranes can be very important, and some tumors won't grow only on tissue culture. They need um, plates, they need some matrix to grow on. <clears throat> some cells even use a feeder cell layer. You want to think about your media formulation. Do you want to define the media where you, everything is known that's put in there, or is it okay to just add serum, which provides a lot of growth factors, um, matrix proteins, and hormones, and, but you don't know exactly what's in there. And at sometimes you can let the cells grow in the serum and then remove it, so you have a defined media doing some of your um, signaling assays, for example. You want to have pH control, so we typically control pH by growing the cells in the CO incubators that contain CO2, and the media contains sodium bicarb to keep the cells at a physiological pH, unless you're interested in looking at changes in pH and how it affects the cells. And then you want to obviously grow the cells at um, the appropriate temperature and humidity, and again, this is controlled in the um, tissue culture incubators. So. Advantages of using tissue culture, it's the ability to control the environment for maximizing cell growth. You can characterize your samples, um, and this can be done on an, a very economical scale, and you can scale up or down, and you can look at mechanisms, again, having a very defined um, situation. And um, as we'll talk about, you want to do your best to model what's going on in vivo. But the limitations are, when you take the cells out of their environment, there's sometimes markers that aren't expressed, and you have loss of some phenotypic characterizations typical of the tissue from which the cells are isolated. You have genetic instability, and Bennett just talked about how tumors are heterogeneic. And so if you have some tumor cells that are growing very fast after 30 passages, they're going to overgrow those cells that are growing slow. And so now what you looked at from the cells at passage one is going to be completely maybe different result from what you have at passage 30, and that's very important to consider. Um, here we have, usually most people are looking at cells just again grown on tissue culture dishes, so you're looking at 2D versus 3D, and again I'll talk about how you can overcome this limitation. And then there's a loss of cell-cell interactions and a loss of systemic components involved, like the um, hormone regulation that you would have in vivo. So you just need to think about all of these things of what, what you're missing when you're just looking at a tumor cell on a tissue culture dish. 
So here's, our, here's the other factors that affect the behavior in vivo, and it's basically reiterating what I just said, but the local microenvironment is important because of the metabolites, the local growth factors, the extracellular matrix, and the architecture that is involved there with the, in interaction with the extracellular matrix. You're, you have cell-cell interactions, um, and then the circulating proteins and hormones. So one way to get around some of this in vitro is we can do some three-dimensional modeling. We can look at the growth of tumor cells on a 3D matrix like Matrigel or Collagen 1 gels. And Matrigel are also is sold as basement membrane extract. Um, it's um, derived from a tumor that's secreting a lot of the basement membrane proteins, such as laminin, fibronectin, and the collagens and the proteoglycans. And you can mix this all together and get it to gel at 37 degrees. And then you can seed your cells on top of it, add some more matrix gel to the top of that, and then they'll grow into a 3D architecture. In fact, normal breast cells will form an asini-like structure that howls out like a normal breast asini. So, and you will see many different changes um, uh, due to this. So this architectural change can lead to epigenetic changes. And these three-dimensional modelings can be more predictive of in vivo behavior. And here I borrowed a figure from um, Mina Bissell's lab, and this is um, the lead author is Kenny. And here they were growing different breast cancer cells on tissue culture plastic, and you see they all look pretty similar. There's really not much you can tell from the phenotype of uh, these cells and what they might do in vivo. But when they grew them on the matrix gel, as I mentioned, embedding them in the matrix gel and having 3D growth, you can see that now the cells com look completely different from each other. And so they, have, they go from having organized nuclei to very disorganized nuclei, and you can look at the differences in their cell adhesions. And just even here, visually looking, you can tell that these cells will be more aggressive in vivo, and of course, they prove this. And so just looking along this, going from um, left to right, these cells are more aggressive in vivo. And it gives you a lot more information um, than just growing on the tissue culture plate. And here is an example from my lab about the importance of interactions of different cell types. So the alterations in migration is thought to be associated with the cell's ability to be able to move um, migrate, invade, and then metastasize more. So one of the assays that's commonly done in the labs is to um, put cells here on the top of a filter which has um, pores that the cells can move through uh, if they're able to migrate. And then we let the cells move through, they'll bind to the bottom, and we can detect the cells on the bottom of the filter, the cells that have moved through. So I'm interested in a proteoglycan receptor called Syndican 1. And using, as I heard, I see here you have learned about the shRNA MERS, to, we knock down expression of syndican 1. Our control is a non silencing shRNA, so cells are transfected stably to express the non silencing siRNA or knock down a syndican 1. And we found that there was no difference in their migration rates when we had decreased syndican 1 in the breast cancer cells. But I'm really interested in breast cancer um, metastasis to the brain. So I wanted to see, well, what about its interactions with some of the cells that it would interact with in the brain? And in order for cells to get out of circulation and cross the blood-brain barrier, they have to interact with several different cell types. So I utilized this um, in vitro uh, system, and what you do here is grow human astrocytes on the bottom of the filter, which usually surround the endothelial cells in the brain. You grow endothelial cells on the top of the filter, and you let them grow, grow for three days, and they form a very tight um, barrier that even BSA will not pass through. You seed your tumor cells on the top, and then after, a few, after about 24 hours, you can see the cells move through and quant quantitate these cells on the bottom. And now we can see that the cells that had knocked down expression of syndican 1 are indeed moving slower through this, um, migrating slower through these cells. So this interaction of the cells is very important to see a, an effect. And as you'll see in a minute, I'll show you how this does mimic what's occurring in vivo. So moving on to the animal models, um, there's several different types of animal models, and I'm just going to briefly go over these. 
There's the seno graft models, which is an engraftment of human tumor cells into mouse or rat immunocompromised mice, so, or rat, rodents. And so you need to have immunocompromised mice so they don't reject the human cells. It, these two models are usually predictable and have rapid tumor formation for the known models. Um, and here you can look at human tumor growth, and it can be adventation when targeting with a human-specific drug. You can inject the tumor subcutaneous, so just underneath the skin, and the, these tumors are really easy to monitor, and a lot of drug companies do this so that they can measure um, the decrease in the tumor formation when they treat with a drug. The other models are transgenic and knockout models, and these our altered expression of genes in mice and or rats which leads to tumor formation. They represent a more natural in vivo history of tumor development. So it starts out from a hyperplasia, moves on into malignant disease, and um, usually then there's the, the normal interaction with the stroma, uh, angiogenesis occurs at a normal where, I, where with the xenograss you're throwing in highly malignant cells usually, and they grow very fast, and so their interaction with the, the stromal um, components, at least it's something, but it might not be as good as in these transgenic and knockout models. And you have a fully immunocompetent animal. The immune system is very important in tumor growth, and so that's a, a big negative of the xenograss is that the immune system is compromised. Here you can also use the altered gene expression can be targeted to specific organs. For example, an MMTV promoter targets expression or knockout to the mammary gland, but it's not completely specific. You might get tumors also in the salivary glands. So the negative here is the tumors that develop may be multifocal in origin. So what are these tumors in the salivary gland secreting that could be affecting the mammary gland tumors? And this might not be what would occur in a human patient. And also, why a lot of drug companies aren't using these models is because um, few models have 100% penetrance of the tumor phenotype, and most take several months to develop tumors. And there's also a lack of me um, metastases in most of these models. So that's, this, you need a huge number of animals um, to be able to do s drug studies. Okay, so here's some examples of xenograss models that are currently going on. In, um, my lab or other labs in the cancer center. So ex some experimental models of uh, breast cancer metastasis is an intercardiac model where we inject tumor cells in the left ventricle of the mouse's heart. So the tumor cells then can move throughout the um, body and you can find metastases in many different organs. A more simple experimental model is to just tail vein inject the tumor cells, so an IV injection, and you can see METs then usually only in the lung, sometimes in the liver, depending on the cells. In fact, in Krein's lab, they now have a cell line that'll even go to the bone, it's so aggressive. Um, the, the downside of these are they're experimental in that they're only looking at the later stages. You're looking at cells getting out of the bloodstream and then growing, but you're missing the beginning step. So, you would want to put the tumors then into a more appropriate site to look at them growing and then metastasizing, and we can inject the cells into the orthotopic site, which is the site where they'd normally be found in a patient. So we can, from um, breast cancer, inject the cells into lactiferous ducts, and then we can look at primary tumor growth and spontaneous metastasis, so then you're looking at all of the steps of metastasis. Um, we can inject right into the bone, because this is a site that you would find in patients. Um, a lot of breast cancer patients, unfortunately, have bone metastasis, so we can inject them right into the bone. Um, other models that are available that I'm aware of right now um, are colon cancer models, where you can inject orthotopically interfecal um, and oral squamous carcinomas, which um, Dr. Munchie that's talking tomorrow is doing in his lab, where they inject tumor cells directly into the tongue. And if you're interested, um, this is not all-inclusive, because not everyone signed up, but there are some examples of different animal models um, in the cancer center um, here. You can look up and um, then possibly contact the labs. Okay, so I just wanted to show you a little bit of my work and then um, about using these model systems. So here again, I'm using the same cell lines, the cell lines that were, um, have the knockdown, Syndicam 1, or the control, and we injected them into the left ventricle of the mouse heart, 
And then after four weeks, dissected these mice and looked for metastases by the fluorescent dissecting scope. And what you can see is um, there is many, there is a lot less tumors found in the mice injected with the syndicin one neckdown cells compared to the control cell line. We can quantitate these using a um, couple different uh, softwares, metamorph analysis software, so cell profiler. And you can see that not only are the number of brain mets decreased, but also the size of these brain mets are decreased. We looked at um, metastases in the bone, and we saw that there was um, no difference in the metastases to the bone. So this is um, correlating with what I saw in my in vitro system, that it was only when I looked at their interaction with these brain cells, that blood-brain barrier, that I saw a decrease in their migration. And I saw a decrease in their ability to grow in the, in the brain. Uh, but there's no difference in their growth in the bone. So we also want to look, though, at their primary growth. And is there any difference in their growth? And so I borrowed this slide from Daniel Toft. And um, here he nicely depicts how we can inject the cells directly into the lactiferous duct. So we just direct into the fourth nipple of um, these mice. And then the tumors will grow in the environment, again, of the mammary fat pad. So they should be interacting with the stromal cells of the mammary gland and, and the matrix. And you can see here the tumors growing in this mouse. And you can see they're detected by the M-cherry fluorescent protein. So we did this again. Oh, sorry. Here also is um, detection of the metastases. You can see these here. This is a lymph node where you see no tumor. But this part of the lymph node, you can see tumor, fluorescent tumor. This whole lymph node is completely engulfed in tumor. And you can see little metastases here in the lung. So we can count these tumors and these meta or excuse me, count the metastases and look at if there's differences in the mice injected with the um, knockdown cells or the control cell line. And here we've looked at, you can also measure their, their growth rate over time. So we saw no difference in their growth. I don't know why these are showing up so small. Anyway. Um, you can see that their end tumor weights are no different. And then we found that there was no difference in their, um, their lymph node metastases. And then we also found that there was no difference in their metastases to the ovaries in this model and little difference in their metastases to the lung. And so we counted both very small micromets and macromets. So basically, again, this is, it was very important for us to look at this and, and, and see what's going on in vivo, but it tells us that it looks like syndicin 1 is specific in its role in metastasis to the brain, but not to a lot of other organs, which we're very excited about. But so in closing, I just want you to carefully think about the questions you're asking and choose your model considering all factors. And, and just know, no model is perfect. Each one has positive and negative factors to consider. I obviously am using the xenographs. Um, they are not, again, they don't have the immune cells, so that's a part that really bothers me. But there's no good transgenic model where I can look at brain metastasis. So this is what I'm going to deal with to look at, at it. But I, you just need to think about all those positives and negatives and, and know that where your limitations are. Any questions? Yep. Do we have any chemical carcinogenesis in these models? I don't. I don't know if other people on campus are, but uh, there's um, like skin cancer models. Is Jill doing any of those? I don't think so. Where you can induce with TPA and then DMBA. Um, so I, I think there's people that would know about that. I have not done that. I definitely, um, I think like all of these models, that's where what Bennett said that was one way I was telling people earlier that I marketed myself to, to move into tenure track was just having the animal experience. A lot of people don't have it. But I taught, myself, I taught the tongue tumor injection to Dr. Munchie's lab. I did the interstitial injection. I mean, once you get an idea of how to handle animals and you're not afraid of them, that's the biggest part of it, then you can do almost anything. And I'm, I'm happy to help people you know, designing them, I obviously can't do everyone's experiments, but I'm happy to talk to people about it. Anything else? All right. My lab and everyone involved, thanks.